Well, welcome to the Center for Fiction. My name is Melanie McNair. I'm the Senior Director of Public Programs here. And um, for those of you who don't know us, we're the only literary nonprofit that focuses on the creation and enjoyment of fiction. How many of you are visiting us for the first time this evening? Like, okay, great. So there's a few of you. Um, we are having a membership special for everybody um, to know in September. So our individual memberships are $150 and then you get access to the amazing space upstairs for a whole year with that, as well as checking out books from our library and many other benefits. So check it out before you leave. I wanna say also hello to those of you who are joining us on YouTube. A few housekeeping announcements. We will have an audience Q&A tonight. And if you're here, please raise your hand and one of our fabulous interns will bring a microphone to you. Uh, wait until you have that so that the people on YouTube can hear you as well. And if you're watching on YouTube, you may add your questions to the chat at any time. And we'll read one or two of those out at the end of the event. We have two partners for tonight's event. I want to give a special thanks to uh, Lily Philpott at the Asian American Writers Workshop and Bridget Hughes at a public space for partnering with us. Wherever Yi Young goes, writers gather, right? Um, it's now my pleasure to introduce you to the publisher of Faro Strauss and Giroux, Mitzi Angel, to introduce our guests. everyone what a very special evening um, so delighted to be here um, thank you to the Center for Fiction I've been working with Yi Yun Lee for many years now and when I was a young editor in London I read three short stories by Yi Yun sent to me over email and those were the early days of email I have to say um, and I read the first few pages and I realized that something quite extraordinary was taking place and that something about the way this person who I'd never heard of was organizing her sentences and was conveying her thoughts and feelings was just out, out of the ordinary. Um, and there wasn't really anything I could compare her work to. I couldn't quite I couldn't easily say that it was like this or like that, which you're so often called on to do in this world. And um, I ended up publishing the book, thank thankfully, and I've known her ever since. And she's gone, to, she's gone on now to publish 10 books. She's won so many awards, and most recently the Penn Malamud Award. So congratulations, Yi Yun. Um, and, um, I can't wait to hear her talk about the Book of Goose, which I think is a tremendous, tremendous achievement. Um, I'm delighted also that she'll be talking to Rivka Galchen. Um, oddly, it's slightly coincidental, I think, that um, I also published one of Rivka's first uh, works, and I published in the UK her first novel, Atmospheric Disturbances. So I've known Rivka for quite a long time as well. Um, and she's one of our very favorite uh, FSG authors. So it'll be great to hear her asking what I know will be extremely intelligent uh, questions. Uh, and I can't wait to hear the questions and the answers. So thank you, everyone. show off the bag. <laughs> it's not just a goose, it has feet also. <laughs> yes, yes it's, it's, my, it's my emotional support, goose feet. <laughs> um, because I was so daunted by the thought of asking questions other than what your favorite color and animal are, I was going to start by asking you to read the opening of your book. <laughs> so okay. of course, yes. This is a very goosey part of the book. Yeah, I, I think I'm just going to read the, the opening page. So you get a sense of the voice. You cannot cut an apple with an apple. You cannot cut an orange with an orange. 
You can, if you have a knife, cut an apple or an orange, or slice open the ender belly of a fish, or if your hands are steady enough and the blade is sharp enough, sever an umbilical cord. You can slash a book. There are different ways to measure depths, but not many readers measure a book's depth with a knife, making a cut from the first page all the way down to the last. Why not, I wonder? You can hand a knife to another person, betting with yourself how deep a wound he or she is willing to inflict. You can be the inflictor of the wound. One half orange plus another half orange do not make a full orange again. And that is where my story begins. An orange that did not think itself good enough for a knife, and an orange that never dreamed of turning itself into a knife. Cut and be cut, neither interested me back then. My name is Agnes, but that is not important. You can go into an orchard with a list of names and write them on the oranges, Francoise and Pierre and Diane and Louise. But what difference does it make? What matters to an orange is its orangeness. The same with me. My name could have been Clementine or Ordette or Herinata, but so? An orange is just an orange, as a doll is a doll. Don't think that once you name a doll, it is different from other dolls. You can base it and close it and feed it empty air and put it to bed with the lullabies you imagine a mother should be singing to a baby. All the same, the doll, like all dolls, cannot even be called dead as it was never alive. The name you should pay attention to in this story is Fabian. Fabian is not an orange or a knife or a singer of lullabies, but she can make herself into any one of those things. Well, she once could. She's dead now. The news of her death arrived in a letter from my mother. The last of my family is still living in St. Remy, though my mother was not writing particularly to report the death, but the birth of her, first, her own first great one child. Had I remained near her, she would have questioned why I have not given birth to a baby to be added to her collection of grandchildren. This is one good thing about living in America. I am too far away to be her concern. But long before my marriage, I stopped being her concern. My fame took care of that. America and fame, they are equally useful if you want freedom from your mother. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I, I want to start by just saying um, one obvious thing, which is that I'm thrilled to be on the stage with you. And I, I, um, I've, I've actually read everything that um, you've written. <laughs> so I don't want to, so that, that's a bit, you know. And, and even letters you've written to people who aren't me, so don't worry about it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I, I wanted to start asking with this novel, obviously this novel is, a, is about many things or whatever that means for something to be about, but at the center of this novel is this friendship, which is already brought up in, this, in the opening between Agnes and Fabian. Mm -hmm. And one of them, Agnes is alive, but so almost always working to be invisible. Right. And, um, and Fabian is, is this figure who this word eventually gets attached to her of, of, of being monumental. And I just was, wanted to ask you a little bit about how this, I, how this book came to you as two friends, as a friendship story, mm -hmm. really, an unusual friendship. And you've really made an effort to their families are there, we know about them, but they're just 
their importance is nothing compared to this friendship. So I just was curious to, to start there with this sort of these two pretty young girls. Right, right. You know, I, I think there are writers who are good at writing love stories, and I'm not one of them. So I, I usually, I like to write about friendship, but never friendship at this age. And there's something about friendship between girls, you know, between the age 12 and 14. They're, you know, they're nearly, they're on the cusp of becoming their, their entire human being, but they're still young. And there's something about girls that age, probably boys too, I, I think children that age, I would say, they have the ability to imagine the world into being, into existence. And the real world, whatever that physical world there, does it not matter. I think you know a lot of people would have that experience with you know that period of time. And this pair of friends, especially, they they grew up they grew up in the the countryside in France after World War II. They did not have many things. You know, in a way, I think it was to their benefit that they did not have anything. They did not have any possessions, so they could imagine anything and I just love them <laughs> sorry I'm sorry <laughs> they're, like they're there I, I, I see them I, I'm, I was fascinated from the very beginning when they came to me you know as a pair they came to me in this very strange dialogue they had it went into the book was they talk about how to grow happiness and Fabian said well, we can grow happiness as potatoes and beets, you know, one crop, another crop, we, we would certainly have our happiness. And Agnes was more cautious, said, what if both crops failed? And Fabian said, then we will become butchers. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the moment I knew they were alive for me, because when she said, then we'll become butchers, I thought it's a story about cutting and killing. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it's like cutting, cutting, slashing. <laughs> um, I, I wanted to sort of ask you because I actually do think friendship is quite hard to figure out what is the arc of a friendship. The arc of a love story is quite clear. It's right. sort of they come fully together, they break apart. There's a sort right. of natural line. And you came up with a really unusual line for this friendship and I, I was curious about that because I do think it's very hard to write about friendship. Right. Friendship, especially in childhood, I think it was Agnes who mentioned childhood friendship is almost like fate. It, you cannot make it happen. It happens by itself. You know, I, I, you know, I think parents would know, you know, you have, you have children play dates together. They don't become friends. <laughs> they, don't, they, don't, they don't get attached to each other. And then there are strange things happen between people, especially between children. I think, I think that's one really attractive thing to me is their friendship exists right away. As a writer, I don't have to explain it. I just have to watch the friendship. Yeah. And I'm, I, I don't want to... Um, give away the book, and I don't think I'm giving away the book, um, and I know some people have already read the book, but one element that happens is sort of Fabian is so, she sort of the or, feels more like the origin, the, and the kind of hot nuclear energy in the, mm -hmm. in the novel, and, um, and Agnes is often her avatar, although that, right. that uh, alters in several moments, and you do this wonderful thing where without getting to make any choices, suddenly sort of Fabian has foisted a kind of life arc onto, onto Agnes. And, I, and uh, I guess I just wanted to ask you a little bit about um, what made you sort of fit the characters together in that, in that way. I mean, maybe you were just watching them, but just mm, yeah. maybe after you wrote it, like what you thought about that the, power dynamic between right. them. Right, you know, Agnia said, you know, they are the same orange, one part facing the sun, one part facing the darkness. Well, that's, you know, that's her original explanation. Well, I, I think, in, I, you know, I te when I teach, I teach uh, Elisa Bowen's notes on writing a novel, and I, because I really, I love her concept of alternative. She said, you know, characters start in a novel with alternatives. 
and in the, as the plot goes forward, as the novel de develops, the characters lose their alternatives. And the, by the end of the novel, the, the characters no longer have their alternatives. That's when, you know, inevitably you reach the end of the novel. I really like that concept, but I think Fabian and Agnes, very rarely you see characters without alternatives. And they, they came to the world without alternatives. Their life was actually set by the countryside, by their upbringing. You know, they had their whole life in front of them, you know, being just peasant girls, doing farm work, getting married, giving birth to children, and you know, if you're lucky, you don't die from yeah. childbirth. So they had no alternative to their at the beginning of their life. So what's interesting to me is Fabian knows, I think. She doesn't have alternative. She sets out to, to, to make alternatives for themselves. She sets out to become an author or to write stories, to write books, so that they too can have an alternative. And so I think the novel maybe is different than most of the novels I have written or most of the novels I have read was, the novice from beginning was no alternative, and then they gained alternatives. And of course, you know, the novel has to see that they lose the alternatives. And in the <laughs> <laughs> as a novelist, you just always have to be sort of ruthless. You know what I mean? I'm Even sure. brutal. <laughs> <laughs> I, I actually feel fearful sometimes about about that um, that I don't have the courage to be that rough. And I feel like all great books are truly rough on their characters. And I see that with students too, that they have that same feeling they have almost towards a child, which is that they don't want them to lose too much face or suffer right. too much. And I, 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 I have that emotion, even though intellectually I disagree. And I think it's essential to sort of put them under the same pressures we all, we all, we I, all go I, through. I was just going to say, life is not kind to us. No. <laughs> <laughs> Why do we want a kind to us? <laughs> And I, I wanted to share a little bit about um, what you were talking about. So um, neither of them have alternatives. They're, it's, it's as if Agnes is very poor and Fabian is even more almost unimaginably poor. And Agnes has education. Right. I mean, some education, some education not very yeah. much. Um, and, and Fabian has really none at all, um, but a kind of tremendous intellect and creative drive. and. And they, they write this book together, basically a straightforward, in some ways straightforward description of their lives, yeah. of the, their lives in the countryside, which is then received as an almost unbearably dark portrait of suffering. And I, I sort of wanted to, I sort of, um, I wanted to ask you a little bit about that because it's almost comic in the book, the way that, <laughs> They don't really feel they've written that kind of book, although there's a sense that Fabian has more of a control over how it's received. And it, and it just sails to enormous success because the, the French public is just kind of titillated and thrilled. And um, I don't know, I thought that must touch on a lot of things that you've thought about personally as a writer, um, bringing stories when you, especially early in your career, you were bringing stories that were unfamiliar to an American audience but probably in some ways normal mm -hmm. stories that you were familiar with in China. And, and, and we were all thrilled. <laughs> and I wonder, I wonder if there's some emotional parallel there or that's just the kind of weird belly way of writing a book that all those emotions come together. Right, I, you know, I think the longer we write, I, I feel, at least for myself, the longer I write, the more porous I become really my life bleeds into work and the work bleeds into my life and it's two-way bleeding. Yes, I think, you know, I, I, with I, a knife, <laughs> off stage. Slash, yeah. slash, slash. <laughs> oh, sorry, this is not a very deep book, by the way. No, I think you're right. I think the stories Fabian and Agnes write, it's really just how they live. They go out to herd pigs, they go out to herd, you know, cows. People die, babies die, mothers die. I mean, this is just people die, you know, just that's countryside, yeah. right? I remember when I was in the army, there was a girl from the countryside. I always remember she was so 
just cheerful. She said, well, in the countryside, women die. She described her hometown. She said, women really die like apples falling from the tree. <laughs> <laughs> this is like a 16-year-old girl yeah. being so cheerful about this. It was very interesting to me. But, <laughs> sorry. No, so back to Agnes and Fabia. Yes, they have told stories about their lives, but I think it just happened to be 1954. You know, the whole French publishing is eager to hear the country, about the countryside and their American occupation. And of course, London, you know, to London, to America, people want to hear these stories. So, so but I think who is the most, you know, clear-sighted person is that terrible Mrs. Townsend, the <laughs> English boarding school, and finishing school mistress. She said, you know, you think you're a genius. No, you're, you're really not. They're just momentarily interested in you. Next day, they're going to have, you know, some, some urchin, you know, alley urchin, and tell a story about growing up in the back alleys. And that's going to be a famous book. And the next day is going to be a workshop, you know, little seamstress from a workshop. So, yeah, I think that's, you know, that seems to be sort of inevitable for writers who write strange stories. <laughs> well, and also it's strange for them. Yeah. You know, it's their life. Yeah. I mean, I'm also curious because, I mean, I think the things that you were writing most recently before this were set mostly in California, where you yeah, had yeah. lived for a long time. And um, suddenly we're in France at 70 <laughs> yeah. years. I mean, it's a bit of a, you know, it's a bit of a surprise. And, and we're also in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, which yeah. I was excited by. I love Lancaster, Pennsylvania. I and love. And you <laughs> kind of almost punish your character by marrying her to a guy named Earl, which I feel like <laughs> is like, you, I felt like you were being rough on her then. Um, and and I, I, yeah, I mean, how did, how did that, yeah. That happened. Uh, it doesn't feel like a research book, like you were researching that, that time no, period. It feels no. natural. I, I, you know, I, I make a point not to, I mean, the, story, the, the novel doesn't feel historical to me. I think historical novels feel to me you have to do research. You have to have accumulation of facts, and you have to have, make up a story to present those facts. I, you know, they, they just happen to be French girls. They happen to be in the French countryside. I did, I did a certain amount of research, but not a lot. The thing is, I think if you think about doing research, there's something off, because then you want to, you want to say, I'm going to convince the readers this is French countryside. But Agnes and, and Fabienne, they would never think of themselves as poor girls living in the poor countryside in France. That's, how not, that's not how they define themselves. How they define themselves is, they are two girls in the center of the world, and that world is made by themselves. Anything outside the world does not matter. So they're not ob obliged, they're not, have, they, they, they do not have that burden to convince anyone, anything. They're just saying, this is our world. This is an entire world. You have to accept our world. So I think if you write from within these characters, it's quite liberating. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's also quite, just, it's a relief. You don't have to do, you don't have to say, you know, what do they eat? <laughs> They're hungry all the time. <laughs> <laughs> um, I love, I think there's like a Borges line, like there's no camels in a thousand and one I, Arabian yes. nights. <laughs> um, but uh, there's, there's even this, uh, I was curious about one of the elements of, of their life is that Agnes's brother uh, is young and he's dying, and then the family is watching him die, and he's dying slowly, and it's and it's destroying the mother, and it's it's just extraordinarily painful thing going on. And I wondered about the inclusion of that because it seemed like part of what was going on was that even the most extreme kind of pain in her household didn't measure up to her relationship with. Right. Fabian. So I, I was curious about how you were managing that, that almost like the landscape, their landscape, their right. emotional landscape. That's a very good word, emotional landscape, because, you know, if you, if you actually exit their emotional landscape, their life is pretty hard. You know, a sister died from birth, childbirth. Yeah. You know, mother died, brother died. You know, it's, the brother died from TB, and it's, it's all very painful. 
But the thing is, I think children, we're not all children, but there are certain kind of children, I think Agnes and Fabian are that kind of children. They really have a natural immunity to certain things. And, and I think that natural immunity comes from their imagination, also from their indifference. At some point, Agnes said, you know, later, in retrospect, she acknowledged that they're, it's a blessing that they're not attached to their parents. She said, we don't love our parents, but we don't hate our parents either, which is a very big thing. I think most children either love their parents they're or attached. hate. Yeah, either way, there's either a bond. Way, yeah. <laughs> but I think they happen to be at a place because, well, they grew up together. They really, you know, they grew into each other. They, be, they really get anything from each other. So I think that kind of indifference to the adult world I've seen that in children, and you know, it's, it's quite amazing. Some children outgrow that, not all children outgrow that, and they really build that up as their entire world and entire you know, existence is nothing matters but each other. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that sounds very crazy. Um, and you know, you, meant, you made reference earlier to there's an element in the novel where the um, the girls have this kind of tremendous publishing success, and, and Agnes is, is kind of prettier and slightly more presentable. So, so Fabian sort of forces her to be the author on the book, and, and, and even though it, it's hard to say, it's hard to untangle it, but they've written it together, but, but Fabian was the driver of the book. And, the, and then you enter into this like um, moment in the story where the story could have become My Fair Lady. <laughs> Um, because there's a kind of boarding school mistress and she wants to kind of take this country girl and make her um, the exact right kind of girl to be, in, to be in Paris and make her, she gets her the clothes and she's going to give her the education and she's going to do all these things. But it's not a, a My Fair Lady story because it just seems incredibly brutal and destructive and, and like a terrible parenting, basically. So. Um, but I, I, it, it is like you're entering into this other kind of story and you're interacting with that other kind of story. This, the, the supposedly happy story um, of My Fair Lady where, where she's sort of successfully brought up in class. And here it's presented as this sort of violent attempt to move her. And I, I, I wanted to ask you how quickly or slowly you you sort of solved what you wanted to do with that element. Because, it, it, you know, it could have gone more than one way. I did feel like there were choices. Like you said, Fabian sort of generates options, but not really for herself. She opts out of them very deliberately again and again. She generates options for her friend. And it's not clear whether she's being kind or aggressive to her friend or both. And I, I just kind of was curious how you solved that right. moment. Yeah, I, you know, I think Fabian doesn't really know where the game goes. She, she, she doesn't think it's writing. She calls it a game. And she does it to amuse themselves. And she says again and again, they have to amuse themselves. Nobody amuses them. And they really do amuse <laughs> each other. They're very entertaining sometimes. But, but I think that kind of violence, you know, I, I guess I'm just always drawn to psychological violence. This year, physical violence too. Fabian is physical violent, but just the, just the murky motivations within human hearts. I think that's why we write, isn't it? You know, we, you know, does she really want something good to happen? We don't know. You know, she's like, yeah, why not? Let's just entertain ourselves. But but I think I think once. Agnes moves into the world, you know, it is a, in a way, it is a literary hoax, right? Anytime there's a hoax, there are people who work on it and people who gain from these kind of games. So I think all the adults are trying to gain something. The publishers are gaining something. The photographers and, and, and the headmistress, they want to gain something. And, and I think that's just how the world works. And I can't. I mean, 
in my heart, I mean, when I was writing it, deep in my heart, I always had this sort of wishful thinking. Wouldn't it be nice if they could just stay forever together, never parting, never going out of the countryside? They just stay in their own bubble of a brutal world. That's a happier life than anything <laughs> that happens here. But you can't, that you have to move them out to the world. You have to move them to clash with the world. And it's never a good result when you clash with reality. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, <laughs> all right. Um, I, that, I believe you. I, don't mean, I believe I don't, you, but uh, okay, I'm going to forget it so when I go to bed tonight. Father. So okay. I can sleep a little bit better. But um, why do you think Agnes doesn't want what so many people assume she wants, which is to sort of rise in class, send some money home, um, I have some nice clothes. I, I don't know what you know. Th you know things that many, many young girls would want. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, the question is, why doesn't Fabian want that? Yeah. Yes, she doesn't want to be famous. She doesn't. Want, I, she doesn't want her name to be on the book, because. I do think there's a deeper drive in towards the end of the novel. Agnes sort of acknowledges that and said, if Fabian, had Fabian been born in a different society, she would have become one of those geniuses, you know, crazy genius, making masterpiece paintings or writing, you know, beautiful music. Well, yes, I think that that is who truly, who Fabian is. She yeah. is a crazy genius. But she did not have the environment. She did not have the cultivation, you know, for that. I think Agnes, I, I find her so fascinating because she's so muddy. You know, Agnes is, I mean, Fabian is smart, sharp, pure, but also readable. You can read her. You know, she is, she wants certain things that other people don't want. And she also makes a point not wanting those things that others want, right? The good clothes, good food, she doesn't care. But Agnes is muddy. Agnes wants those things, but not enough to make a difference, not enough to change herself, because I think her existence sort of, you know, is either attached to Fabian or it's becoming part of Fabian. I think, in a way, I feel like she, it's a blessing for her to have this friend who's so crazy that she can become this muddy person instead of wanting, you know, at some point she said, all the girls want what? Good sock, stockings, you know, right. good clothes, a little bit of good food, a beautiful notebook. She, she, she doesn't care about those things. And I think, I do think in, in life and in books too, I think there are characters who just happen to want something else. And, and they want it so much. It's, you know, it's a specialized, specialized wanting. <laughs> it's not a, like a general wanting. You just want one thing so, so much. I just feel Agnes just wants that one thing that she actually cannot articulate. What she wants is she wants to be with Fabian forever and ever. That's a fairy tale. <laughs> and it almost feels spiritual. It almost feels like because of her contact with Fabian, she does sort of feel like forsaking the world in order to just maintain that. The, the most painful moment for her is when she is sort of testing what Agnes wants when she gets this offer to go to school. And she really is quite devastated that Agnes tells her sort of to go, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, I feel like that's one of the most emotional moments in the in her life up to then. I also one thing that was absolutely credible and completely refreshing and different is that you made these girls the age of girls becoming women, and you made these girls the age of, you know, especially in their time period and place they are sort of nearing their sex, the sexual power. And almost, almost the, the peak of sexual power comes so much earlier right. in their world. And that is somewhat manipulated by, by Fabian to, to her own ends, but it's so not of value to either of them. Neither of them really deploy it, pursue it, 
are interested in it. And I found that to be realistic and very different from almost anything I read. And then I was just sort of wondering um, how much you were, I mean, again, it, it's not a matter of like what you decided, but you knew that they were of this age. You, you knew there's something extremely powerful about friendship at that age and about their imaginative powers. And there's this external sense that their sexual power is at their peak, but not necessarily right. their sexual right. desire. And, I, and I, I, I just wondered how you chose to navigate that, because you do do something quite dramatic with it um, and, and very different from anything I've ever seen done with that particular age. I guess I just want to ask you about right. that. Yeah, it's... I'm not spoilering it, I know, but I'm semi-spoilering it. It's difficult to <laughs> yeah. explain without spoiling. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. You know, there are people, or I'm just thinking, there are people who have, you know, who have in their possession something, but they just don't care about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, what is valuable to the world is not valuable to them. You know, they don't see the merit in their sexual power, for instance. You know, Agnes is, is recognizing boys want to be nice to her. Yeah. You know, men are looking at her. But she just, I, I, we, when you said there's something spiritual, I just feel that their world is complete already. Why not? Why disturbing that completeness for these silly boys? And and I think that's again, it's not my decision. It's their right. being, okay. and you follow them. I follow them, and I just I found that fascinating. Just how they decide all these things other girls care about. It's almost like they are superior in that way. I don't have to want what you want. That's, that's probably their only superiority over the other girls because they have nothing. They don't have clothes, they don't have food. So what do they have? They have their selves. They're quite brutal in, in that. Their entire being are just very complete. So they, they're born that way, I think. Yeah. Um. Can you talk a little bit about the, the animals in their world, both the eating of the animals and the <laughs> shepherding of the animals, and, all, and just a little bit about their relationship with animals animals in their landscape? Yeah. Okay. Not necessarily the geese. How much spoiler can yeah, we get? Yeah, uh, it's up to you. <laughs> <laughs> There's even a snake. There's a snake. Yeah. There, there are a lot of pigs. Pigs are very brutal in, that, in this novel, but pigs in general are brutal. They're smart and brutal. They can be good accomplice for destroying murder evidence. That's <laughs> what I can tell you. <laughs> and pigs are very useful. And when, when Agnes published a book, a very curious reader wrote, writes a letter to Agnes and said, did you realize you wrote a new way to destroy murder evidence? <laughs> <laughs> and someone else said, how fast do pigs eat bodies? You know, it's, it's very, Countryside. It's very countryside. <laughs> and Fabian, who has kind of tremendous manipulative powers over people, also has these powers over oh, animals. animals. Yeah. I, th that's the part, you know, someone said she's a mystery. She's a mystery in that there's, I mean, she has all the powers. She, she, she mimics animals. She does birds cry, she does animal cry, but she's also very brutal with these animals. So animals also fear her and people fear her too. You know, I, I think there are people like that in the world, and Fabian happens to be one of those. I think quite frightening, right? Quite fascinating, too. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. There's not as much death and destruction no, no, no. as you're hoping there is. No, 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 <laughs> like, that's, that's, yeah. But they're funny. No, yeah, yeah they're very, yeah, they're funny. absolutely. Yeah. Um, did, you, did your feelings about these girls and their friendship evolve as you were writing the book? Were you, because I felt like for me, um, you know, we all enter a book by projecting some little sliver of our life into it that helps us get a little bridge into there. Yeah. And um, for me, the book really reminded me of, I 
I felt co-located with, with Agnes and with the way that certain people will have an overwhelming charisma, or at least to me, they'll have an overwhelming charisma, and that there'll be something that like kind of disturbs my orbit and I start, I have, I right. feel that. And, um, and usually over time, something, something alters in, in, that, in that sense or some, some, some insight about the person changes right. the dynamic. And, and so I wondered, I felt like this was about being close to an overwhelmingly bright person. And I wondered if anything changed about your, about your thoughts about the kind of charisma, um, power, mm -hmm. singularity that uh, Fabian has right. as you spent this time sort of playing it out. Right. Because you, again, no spoilers, but you, even, at, even at, in when we read this, the opening of this book and we get the sense that obviously they had, the girls haven't been in touch for a long time, it's still the most powerful right. Right. figure in her life. Right. You know, yes, I think we have, I'm sure we all know that kind of very bright, very brutal, but also just overpowering kind of personality. But I also think things, life is strange. You know, I, I think the strangest thing, the most mysterious thing is life itself you know fiction always is a little bit more simplified yeah. i remember when i when mitzi read the book mitzi said this is probably the most autobiographical novel you have ever read <laughs> <laughs> and i said oh yes how did you know that how did you guess that no i i wrote a companion piece to to the to the novel when i was working on the novel it was published it was actually a nonfiction piece, which, you know, again, I feel like how much of our own life bleeds into books. Sometimes you don't know. I, was just, I think part of the puzzle I had was, you know, it's entire different kind of friendship was from this. But I had a friend when I was just between age 15 and 24. Every time she saw me, she said, when are you going to start writing? She knew things about you that you didn't know about yourself. I did not yourself. know. Yeah. I did not know. I wanted to be a writer. I said, I don't want to be a writer. I have nothing to write about. But she kept asking that question. It became a refrain. When are you going to become a writer? And there was something eerie about that, you know. <laughs> and I am I being a writer. Did she, did did she did cast she, a spell over she, you? Did Absolutely. Did she cast I did a witch? You know, yeah. you're a witch. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe she is. She, no, I just thought, what? I puzzle. I mean, that was a puzzling piece, but I may have, you know, I, I think life sort of bleeds into book, and I think here Fabian just has a more definitive vision. I am the writer. You're the name. Yeah. <laughs> so it's better. It's easier that way. You know. And then I think that's um, interesting because I don't know you as well as Mitzi knows you, but I also felt. I had a stronger illusion in this book than any other book that I had private access to, <laughs> to you, even yeah. though um, you know these girls don't grow up in China and they don't sort of move countries really, although she briefly goes to England. They don't do any of those things, and it's almost as if that diff. I wondered if that, if that diff, if that larger gap than you than you usually use was felt different in terms of in terms of the way that you wrote, because you do. You know, often we have like, you know, a two or three meter gap between ourselves and the work. But this is a, a big kind of, um, ex the externalities are, are very changed. Very, yeah. yeah. I do think sometimes the psychological, I mean, or the psychology of writing a novel, like if we think about it, it's interesting. Then, you know, we better not to think about it. Yeah, it'll ruin it, right? That's <laughs> it'll don't ruin. go to therapy. <laughs> yes. You'll stop writing. <laughs> yes. But I was talking to someone, I forgot whom, just about editing the book. I forgot, actually, there was a second half of the book. Mitzi told me to sort of <laughs> <laughs> edit out. And it, of course, it was a right decision. But now was I. Was it in Pennsylvania? Not no. in Pennsylvania. Okay. There's a, I won't give it away okay. because it's not, it didn't work. But I now understand in retrospect, everything is so better, so much better in retrospect. In retrospect, I realized 
that part is actually the distance between me and these girls. That's interesting. I have the second part there to protect myself. I think some of the earlier readers, and Bridget was here, and, and Elisa McCracken, they all got a little upset because <laughs> <laughs> I sort of just, you know, put a distance there and everybody is saying, why is this part here? It's in, it was entirely there for my own comfort. It's not for the readers. It's a lot of work for your own comfort. That's good. <laughs> it's like 150 pages of comfort writing. <laughs> <laughs> Um, on that note, <laughs> I wanted to open, open it up to the audience if people had questions. We have a little, someone who can help. Some questions, yeah. Just raise your hand if you have a question. Does this work? Oh yeah, it does through the mask. Okay, good. <laughs> I don't know why I didn't think it would work. Hi, thank you. Thank you so much. I had a question. You sort of alluded to, um, you, you know, you said, like, I, I kind of know what the character is going to do. It's not, like, they're the character is the character, and they're going to make the choices they're going to make. And it's not really my choice. But, of course, you're the writer. So I was sort of wondering, like, how you straddle the tension between creating these characters that kind of come to you and independently live almost are sort of dropped in the world and you, you kind of just move through their world and learn what they're gonna do versus, of course, literally being the writer and knowing that at every crossroads, you are like, you know, a, like a bad thing happens to these two girls and you get to make a choice about how they respond to it or what happens next. So right. I'm wondering how you kind of play with that. Right, I, I'm sure, you know, if you ask different writers, you can ask her, <laughs> she probably has a different answer. <laughs> If you ask different writers, different writers have different answers. And I think, just speaking for myself, I, I'm, I never feel that I am the writer. I've, I feel that I'm just following my characters. And I think the writer part is, in the writing part, well, the writer's role comes in actually in revision part. That's when you say, you know, there's something that's not quite working. There are 150 pages of extra extraneous words you need to cut. But by then, the girl's life or the character's life are set. Their fates are set. So I try not to interfere with their lives. <laughs> I don't mean to sound so mystic, but <laughs> you're a witch. <laughs> but I, I, I think it's different way. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I, I, I do love characters, but I also do love writers who are dead, and sometimes I talk with them as though they just they're next to me, <laughs> <laughs> and I, I say very endearing things, and and I think during the pandemic when we read Tolstoy together, I actually said I. I called Tolstoy, you poor idiot. <laughs> and I think that's the only time Tolstoy got to called poor idiot. But I, I, I think that what I mean is, what I meant to say is, I think they are real beings in my office. I interact with them, which means I interact with myself, actually. It's not I interact with them. <laughs> but I don't know if I answered your question. It's very hard. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, uh, long time fan here. Um, I love your writing because I think despite the heaviness of the things that you write about, there's actually a lot of humor and levity to it. And I just wanted to uh, understand as a you know, fellow writer how you think about that process and how you manage to maintain a very light touch when dealing with such uh, dark, serious subjects. Thank you. I'm so happy people are saying you were actually funny. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't mean to, I, I don't think of myself as a funny writer. I don't think of myself as, say, David Sedaris, right? I was, I'm not him. But I, can I tell a story? Please. <laughs> so I always think there, when I started writing, people kept saying, you're so bleak, your work is so bleak. I've, I hate that word, bleak, you know? I don't feel bleak. 
But, but then one editor in Scotland argued on my behalf and said, Thomas Hardy is bleaker than she. <laughs> I thought Thomas Hardy is very bleak. But the story I was going to tell is, uh, you know, Rebecca West, when she was a young woman, she was 19, she went to visit uh, Thomas Hardy with H.G. Uh, Wells. H.G. Wells took Rebecca West to visit Thomas Hardy. Hardy was already an old man by then. You know, he stopped writing fiction, but he just published a collection of poetry. And the, of course, the critics said it was a dark collection, very bleak. And he got very upset. <laughs> he said to his wife, he said, I don't understand why the critics call this bleak. This is pretty funny to myself. <laughs> and his wife was very good. His wife said, oh, honey, you're not the, you're not the kind of uplifting person you think you are. <laughs> <laughs> so I always think I am less bleak than, I'm, than Hardy, and I'm also a little funnier than Hardy. But the lightness is, I do make myself laugh all the time. When I was working on the book, they made me laugh all the time. You know, I, I think you have to find that kind of lightness, joy. And I want to, you know, I ha probably have said this somewhere in an interview, but I want to make a like a sort of distinction between unhappiness and sadness. I, I think, you know, when people say a novel is sad, they, they sort of mistaken it as unhappy. No, I don't think, I don't think I've ever written unhappy characters. And I don't ever think of myself as unhappy. But I have written sad stories, and very brutal stories, and great loves, but they're not unhappiness, right? So, so I think, I, to myself, I feel like if you say it's an unhappy story, all of a sudden, you just lose that lightness. You lose that humor. You lose the laughter. But sadness has a lot of laughter in it, too. So, so, so I, I do. I think if I can make myself laugh, that's already very good. <laughs> I have a low threshold for laughing. I, I do laugh all the time. <laughs> We have time for one more question from our live audience and then two from our uh, live stream audience. Thank you so much. I know that some of your early work, you were influenced by William Trevor. Oh, yes. And uh, was he one of the people with you in the room on this book? That is such a good question. The short answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> well, can I just say one thing? Like, wait, people thought about when people talk about William Trevor, you know, he's a quintessential quiet, sad writer. But he was a very funny person in life. You know, I took a train ride with him and his wife. The moment we sat down, his wife said, Trevor, tell us, tell a joke, make us laugh. <laughs> 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 so, but I, I think a lot of my early work were written to have conversations with his work. And this book, it's odd. This book, I really can't find. You know, even my last novel, I have conversational partner for the novel. You know, in my head, this book, I, you know, I, I think Agnes and Fabian are very good conversational partner for each other, and I actually did not have any book in my head when I was writing it. You know. When I turn in the manuscript, and Mitzi, of course, you know, pointed out if Elena Ferrante, and then you know, other people pointed out. I thought, oh, thank goodness, I didn't even think about those girls. Otherwise, you would never be able to write about my girls. So, no, it's entire their world, their story, and. But you know, but I am working on short stories, and some of my short stories, I think William Trevor is in the room with my short stories. <laughs> Um, this is a question from Ben, which is, what are some books that inspired the Book of Goose? Wait, so can, you, can you say that again? Um, what are some books that inspired the Book of Goose? Well, what, there was a, it's a completely different, you know, I think people in general would say Elena Ferrante or, you know, Flair Yegi and, 
Mirror Spark, you know, those prime of, <laughs> I love that novel, those girls are horrible. But <laughs> there, you know, there's one novel, the last novel of Elizabeth Bowen wrote, it was a failure. No, not the last book. Well, I think one of the last novels called Little Girls. It, it didn't work, the novel didn't work, but it had two girls and I, you know, when you love a writer so much, you want to know why that novel does not work. And I think I was fascinated by that novel because I just thought it didn't work. And in a letter to her lover, she explained, she said the novel was written as a revenge. <laughs> and I think my conclusion was you can't really write a revenge novel. When you, when you set out to write a revenge novel. Actually, she also meant that novel was a revenge about the lover, him. And it's even more convoluted. And so maybe I cannot say the novel inspired the Book of Clues, but the novel was on my mind. I thought, you know, Bowen wrote a novel about three girls friendship between, uh, among three girls that didn't quite work because she wanted to revenge. She wanted revenge against someone. This book is not a revenge book. So I was, I think I was very adamant. It's not a revenge novel. <laughs> <laughs> I don't write out of revenge, so. And then our final question um, from Hope Kelly. Uh, they say, really struck by your comment that these girls are in the center of the world, thus don't comment on their world. That, w that world is a given. Do you think that all characters, at least all well-rendered characters, are actually in the center of their world? Oh, that's a good question. No, I think some characters are more aware of other people, other world. In, and, but I do think all well-rendered characters should have something, a core somewhere that makes them sort of themselves. But in general, those characters still sort of like get into confrontation with other people, with the outside world. These girls just happen to have such a complete world. <laughs> I think it's very lucky for them. They can maintain that kind of purity for a long time, yes. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs>